We discussed the fixed effect model in the previous session, and now we're going to talk about random effects model. We're going to see how random effects model is different from the fixed effect model, and we're going to contrast those models throughout this section of the lecture. A quick review: under a fixed effect model, we assume that all the studies are identical, and the true effect size is exactly the same in all studies. Well, then the question is: How plausible is that assumption? Is the assumption underlying a fixed effect model plausible? What do you think? Well, then you're going to tell me we have to look at the studies and trying to figure out whether the studies are similar or different. Exactly, that's what you do. For example, the magnitude of the impact of an educational intervention might vary depending on the class size, the age, and other factors, which are likely to vary from study to study. So let's think about this for a moment. Who on earth are going to do a study that is exactly the same as a study that has already been done? You may get two identical studies for those drug trials submitted to regulatory agency for approval. So, for example, for a drug to be licensed in the United States, the drug company have to do two identical trials and submit the results to the FDA. In that case, you may get two identical studies. But for most part, what you're going to have for your systematic review and meta-analysis are different studies done by different investigators in different places. We may or may not know for sure whether these characteristics are actually related to the effect size. For example, you may argue that vitamin D studies done in the United States are going to be different from those studies done in Asia because some countries may be more closer to equator, such that they will have more sun exposure. So their vitamin D level, the baseline level in the participants, are different. So we have all this knowledge. To help us to evaluate the factors that may or may not be the same across studies, but for most time, logic suggests that such factors do exist and will lead to variations to the magnitude of effect. So, what we're we looking at, we're looking at the characteristics of the study. It could be design characteristics or the characteristics of the study participants. For a study setting, for example, and these characteristics may be related to the effect size. So that's we all we care about. We care about these characteristics because they may have effect on the effect size we're going to see in those studies. Here is an example from one of the class project back in 2011. So this study looked at the association between the duration of breastfeeding and the risk of childhood obesity. So the hypothesis is that the duration is associated with the childhood of overweight, and here is what the review group found: our 21 studies were all cohort studies, of which eight were in the U.S., nine in Europe, and four in Asia, Australia, or the Middle East. The studies analyzed breastfeeding duration ranges from as little as zero to 16 weeks to as much as greater than 12 months. And the sample sizes range from a little over 300 to over 117,000. And the study dropout rates prior to follow-up ranges from 5% to 52%. Again, since all these studies are brought together in a systematic review and meta-analysis, they are answering a clinical question, which is: Is there any association between the duration of breastfeeding and the risk of childhood obesity? But each study is different from another study. And we're concerned about whether, for example, the duration for breastfeeding is associated with the association you're going to see. Okay. Here is another example. This example examined the risk of ischemic stroke in people with migraine headache. So, and the authors wrote, as seen in our descriptive tables, there was substantial variation in the sample sizes and characteristics of the research subjects across studies. Subjects were drawn from registries, administrative databases, randomized control trial participants, hospitals, and the community. These various source populations would be expected to be associated with different baseline risk of stroke.
and the studies also varied in mean age of subjects, which ranged from 15 to 97 years, but most focused on the 15 to 50 year old range group. Again, the authors are concerned about the age distribution from these studies, so the younger population group will. Based on our knowledge, have lower risk of stroke, right? Comparing to the older population, and that's why the association you're going to see between the migraine headache and stroke might be different from study to study. Careful qualitative synthesis of the data usually would indicate that there are diversities clinically and methodologically, and they may lead to variations in the magnitude of the effect size. We call this variation underlying the effects heterogeneity. So heterogeneity refers to the clinical, methodological diversities among a set of studies. And what can we do about heterogeneity? Well, if the studies are too different, let's say we're really comparing apples and oranges, we don't have to do a meta-analysis. Remember the first slide I said meta-analysis is only an optional component of a systematic review. If they don't belong together in a meta-analysis, you don't put them together. You can report the estimates from those individual studies, or we could seek to explain why the studies are different. So let's say again the vitamin D and placebo example. All the characteristics could look very similar, but the differences is in, in the vitamin D dose. Well, then we can do additional analysis, trying to figure out if the effect size from vitamin D is associated with the dose. If there are not, there are no good explanations, or we cannot figure out a reasonable reason that why these effects are different, we could allow for it without explaining it. And the way to allow for it is through a random effects meta analysis. Under the random effects model. We assume there's a distribution of two effects. Remember the assumption under the fixed effect model. We assume all studies are identical and there is only one true effect. So here, instead, we assume there's a distribution of them. So again, the circles represent the true effect in studies. We're using the same example. There are three studies, so we have three circles, the true effect. And under the random effects model. These three circles no longer coincide with each other. Now there is a distribution. So if you look at the little normal curve underneath the circles, that's the distribution of the true effect size from those three studies. And in contrast, if you still remember the the plot from the fixed effect model, all these three circles coincide or overlap each other. And again, using the same notation. The observed effect size in study three, the Y three, now differs from the true effect in study three by that epsilon, so the error term within that study. But because the study we're assuming the true effect size follow a distribution, there's one more source of variability. Okay, so the variability is denoted as theta three here, and. Instead of having only the winning study arrow, the true effect in study three, the Y three, can now be written as the mu plus the zeta three plus the epsilon three. Again, the Y three, the point four, can be written out as using the mean of the distribution of true effects among a population of studies, plus the zeta three, which is the difference from the true effect in study three. From the overall true effects plus the error term in that study. Here is another way to look at it. Here, the y three can be written as the mu plus zeta three plus epsilon three. Now, the distance between the overall mean and the observed effect in any given study consists of two distinct parts: the true variation in effect sizes, which is the zeta i's, and the sampling error. Epsilon i's winning the study. More generally, the observed effect y i for any given study can be written as a grand mean plus the deviation of the study's true effect from the grand mean and the sampling error in that study. So now, because we have assumed all the circles again, going back to the circles, which are the true effect in each individual studies, there's a distribution. Okay, 
So the, there are two sources of variance. The first source, if we just focus one study, there is winning study variance. So the distance from the theta i, the circle, to the y i, the square, depends on the winning study variance. So the variance is the random errors winning that study. That's the winning study variance. And we have that. We have exactly the same winning study variance from our fixed effect model. On top of that, there's another level of variance, which is the between study variance. Okay, so the distance from the mu, the triangle, to each theta i, the circles, depends on the variance of the distribution of the true effects across studies, and we call that variance tau square. So because all the circles, again the circles on this plot, they're the true effects in each study, because they don't line up together, they don't coincide with each other, there's a distribution, and that distribution is the between study variance. So under a random effects model, we have to capture both sources of variance, the winning study variance as well as the between study variance. So here's a nice contrast of the fixed effect model and the random effects model. Okay, the different assumptions you're making. Again, if there's only one thing you're going to take away from this section of the lecture is this slide, the different assumptions underneath two different models for meta-analysis. On the left-hand side, all three figures, you have seen all of them, and there are the assumptions for the fixed effects model. There's only one assumption, and they're showing in three different ways. So under the fixed effect model, we assume all the studies share a common true effect size. That's why all the three circles lie on top of each other. So there's only one identical common effect size. However, under the random effects model, if you look at the figure on the upper right-hand corner, there is a distribution. So the three circles no longer line together. There is a distribution of the effect size. Okay, And because of that distribution, we added one more level of variability, which is the between study variance. And that's why you have to capture them in your analysis using the two slightly different equations. So under the fixed effect model, yi equals theta plus your error term winning study. However, under the random effects model, the yi equals the mu, the grand mean, plus the zi, that captures the distance of each circle from that triangle, plus the epsilon i, the error term. Again, the difference is under the fixed effect model, there is one source of variance. If you look at the last set of figures, right, there's only one source of variance, which is captured by that normal curve for each study. However, under the random effects model, we actually have one more layer, which is the variance between studies. That's why you have four normal curves instead of three. We still have that winning study variance, but however, underneath the last plot, that little curve shows you the variability, right? the distribution of the true effect size. That's your between study variance. Now let's take a pause for a moment. Well, what are we trying to do? What are you going to observe from the study? You have three studies, right? And the data you observe are actually, what, always the same. You will get a risk ratio estimate, odds ratio, plus some variance from that study, right? So you observe that the amount of information or data you have in hands will stay the same, regardless of which model you're trying to use, okay? And the purpose of doing a meta-analysis, you're trying to use your data you have in hands and trying to guess where that center of the distribution or where that common effect size is. That's why you're trying to do a meta-analysis. And we're saying there are two different ways to get that number, get your meta-analytical results. Either assume the studies are identical, they're the same, then we're going to use a fixed effect model. If we cannot make that assumption, then we're going to use a random effects model by assuming, well, the studies are slightly different from one another, so we're going to assume the true effect size are not the same, but there's a distribution. So that's what you're doing. You're taking the data you have, you collect it from each individual study and trying to make a best guess where the common effect is. And that guess depends on how different or how similar the studies are. If they're identical, then go ahead and use the fixed effects model. If you cannot make that assumption, then you're better off with the random effects model. That leads us to the second session of the random effects model, which we're going to show you how to do it.